Darwin's Doubt, Part 1. The uh, book we, we are looking at is uh, written by Stephen C. Meyer, who has a PhD in uh, philosophy of science. He's the author of Signature in the Cell. Some of you may remember that book from us going through it before. He started out as an oil industry geophysicist, got a master's degree in geology, and then got uh, a PhD from Cambridge in the philosophy of science. And uh, he's currently the director for the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. And um, uh, I'm just going to throw in a parenthetical that I'm observing. This book is actually a massive expansion of Meyer's article, The Origin of Biological Information and the Higher Taxonomic Categories in the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington. Uh, that was uh, published in 2004, uh, volume 117, number 2, pages 213 to 239. However, uh, as some of you may know, that was retracted, so it doesn't really exist except on the Internet. Um, oh, it was retracted because it depends on who you're listening to. The official reason is because there were irregularities. The fact of the matter is the irregularities are difficult to specify other than somebody who wasn't thoroughly convinced about evolution uh, was the editor and therefore may have given it favored treatment. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, it did pass peer review. and. Uh, uh, it's, it was, um, there was no problem with it until people read what the contents were and then all of a sudden they said, hey, wait a minute, you can't publish this. But, you know, you can't keep a good man down forever, so it is published. And in fact, it was published by a fairly standard HarperCollins. Fairly standard uh, publisher as well. And uh, it made for a while the New York Times bestseller list, um, which is really pretty good for nonfiction. Um, I'm sorry? Yes, it does show you how many people are interested. Um, and uh, comments that are in green are my own comments. Uh, comments that are in white are quotations directly from the book. Uh, again, we're going to give you kind of a quick view, mostly Reader's Digest, but give you a flavor of how he approaches things as much as possible. He starts out his prologue by uh, giving a several paragraph uh, observation that uh, information has caused a revolution not only in our own lives and how we you know view things uh, computers most of us have cell phones that can uh, pull down stuff from the internet right here um, but <clears throat> also it's caused a revolution in how we li view living organisms um, we see all kinds of carefully crafted things that contain digital information and uh, uh, seem to be very much like computer programs. Um, and he is commenting on his book. He says, my book, Signature in the Cell, that, that's my edition, but it was stolen from above, um, <coughs> proved controversial, but in an unexpected way. Though I clearly stated that I was writing about the origin of the first life and about theories of chemical evolution that attempt to explain it from simpler pre-existing chemicals, many critics responded as if I'd written another book altogether. Indeed, few attempted to refute my book's actual thesis that intelligent design provides the best explanation for the origin of the information necessary to produce the first life. Instead, most criticized the book as if it had, been, had presented a critique of the standard neo-Darwinian theories of biological evolution. 
theories that attempted to pro account for the origin of new forms of life from simpler pre-existing forms of life, which of course was not what signature in cell was about at all. Thus, to refute my claim that no chemical evolutionary processes had demonstrated the power to explain the ultimate origin of information in the DNA or RNA necessary to produce life from simpler pre-existing chemicals in the first place, many critics cited processes at work in already living organisms. In particular, the process of natural selection acting on random mutations in already existing sections of information-rich DNA. In other words, these critics cited an undirected process that acts on pre-existent information-rich DNA to refute my argument about the failure of undirected rich material processes to produce, that I'm sure that must be information rich material processes, to produce information in DNA in the first place. For example, the eminent evolutionary biologist Francisco Alaya attempted to refute signature by arguing that evidence from the DNA of humans and lower primates showed that the genomes of these organisms had arisen as a result of an unguided rather than intelligently designed process. Even though my book did not address the question of human evolution or attempt to explain the origin of the human genome, and even though the process to which Ayala alluded clearly presupposed the existence of another information-rich genome in some hypothetical lower primate. Other discussions of the book cited the mammalian immune system as an example of the power of natural selection and mutation to generate new biological information, even though the mammalian immune system can only perform the marvels it does because its mammalian hosts are already alive, and even though the mammalian immune system depends on an elaborately pre-programmed form of adaptive capacity rich in genetic information, one that arose long after the origin of the first life, Another critic steadfastly maintained that, quote, Meyer's main argument, end quote, concerns, quote, the inability of random mutation and selection to add information to, and he puts in there, pre-existing DNA, end quote, and attempted to refute the book's presumed critique of the neo-Darwinian mechanism of biological evolution accordingly. In other words, evolution works, therefore the origin of life must have been natural any, as well. And uh, since living organisms can, according to them, add more and more information, there's no reason why non-living organisms, well, non-living non-organisms, <laughs> should be able to do the same. So you give me the sound bite of the difference between Darwinism and Neo-Darwinism. Well, uh, yeah, the difference between Darwinism and Neo-Darwinism is has to do with DNA here. No, I w take it, <laughs> you can use it uh, or pass it around if there are further comments. Um, I found this all a bit surreal, as if I'd wandered into a lost chapter from a Kafka novel. Signature in the Cell simply did not critique the theory of biological evolution, nor did it ask whether mutation and selection can add new information to pre-existing information-rich DNA. To imply otherwise, as many of my critics did, was simply to erect a straw man. But you can see what's happening is they're trying to say, well, it happens over here, therefore it could happen over here, even though over here there is no mechanism to keep uh, uh, information going at all. To those unfamiliar with the particular problems faced by scientists trying to explain the origin of life, it might not seem obvious why invoking natural selection does not help to explain the origin of the first life. After all, if natural selection and random mutations can generate new information in living organisms, why can it not also do in a, so in a prebiotic environment? But the distinction between a biological and a prebiotic context was crucially important to my argument. This is uh, uh, Steve Meyer speaking. Natural selection assumes the existence of living organisms with a capacity to reproduce, yet self-replication in all extant cells depends on information-rich proteins and nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, and the origin of such information-rich molecules is precisely what origin-of-life research needs to explain. <laughs> 
That's why Theodosius Dobhansky, I guess it's Dobchansky, whatever, one of the followers of the modern neo-Darwinian synthesis can state flatly, pre-biological natural selection is a contradiction in terms. In other words, natural selection won't help you. You can't get differential reproduction until you have reproduction. It's that simple. Or as Nobel Prize winning molecular biologist and origin of life researcher Christian de Duve explains, theories of prebiotic natural selection fail because they quote, need information which implies that they have to presuppose what is to be explained in the first place, end quote. Clearly, it is not sufficient to invoke a process that commences only once life has begun or only once biological information has arisen to explain the origin of life or the origin of the information necessary to produce it. All this notwithstanding, I have long been aware of strong reasons for doubting that mutation and selection can add enough new information of the right kind to account for large-scale or macroevolutionary innovations. The various information revolutions that have occurred after the origin of life. For this reason, I have found it increasingly tedious to have to concede, if only for the sake of argument, the substance of claims I think likely to be false. And so the repeated proddings of my critics has paid off. Even though I did not write the book or make the argument that many of my critics critiqued in responding to Signature in the Cell, I have decided to write that book. And this is that book. Now, we're going to go on again. We're, this is kind of Reader's Digest, and it's less Reader's Digest than some of the earlier ones that we've seen or less complete, because it's a very large book. The extent of the disparity between popular representations of the status of the theory and its actual status, as indicated in the peer-reviewed technical journals, this is the theory of evolution and the theory that you can get information from evolution uh, easily uh, and can explain things like the Cambrian explosion came home to me with particular poignancy as I was preparing to testify before the Texas State Board of Education in 2009. At the time, the board was considering the adoption of a provision in the science education standards that would encourage teachers to inform students of both the strengths and weaknesses of scientific theories. This provision had become a political hot potato after several groups asserted that teaching strengths and weaknesses were code words for biblical creationism, or for removing the teaching of the theory of evolution from the curriculum. Nevertheless, after defenders of the provision insisted that it neither sanctioned teaching creationism nor censored evolutionary theory, opponents of the provision shifted their ground. They attacked the provision by insisting that there was no need to consider weaknesses in modern evolutionary theory because, as Eugenie Scott, spokeswoman for the National Center for Science Education insisted in the Dallas Morning News, there are no weaknesses in the theory of evolution. Oh. At the same time, I was preparing a binder of 100 peer-reviewed scientific articles in which biologists described significant problems with the theory. The binder later presented to the board during my testimony. So I knew unequivocally that Dr. Scott was misrepresenting the status of scientific opinion about the theory in the relevant scientific literature. I also know that her knew that her attempts to prevent students from hearing about the significant problems with evolutionary theory would likely have made Charles Darwin himself uncomfortable. In On the Origin of Species, Darwin openly acknowledged important weaknesses in his theory and professed his own doubts about key aspects of it. Yet today's public defenders of a Darwin-only science curriculum apparently do not want these or any other scientific doubts about contemporary Darwinian theory reported to students. This book addresses Darwin's most significant doubt and what has become of it. It examines an event during a remote period of geological history in which numerous animal forms appear to have arisen suddenly and without evolutionary precursors in the fossil record, a mysterious event commonly referred to as the Cambrian Explosion. 
As he acknowledged in The Origin, Darwin viewed this event as a troubling anomaly, one that he hoped future fossil discoveries would eventually eliminate. The book is divided into three main parts. Part one, the mystery of the missing fossils. Part two, how to build an animal. Part three, after Darwin, what? And then uh, after he's gotten through outlining those three, he introduces Louis Agassi, uh, how do you say that? Agassi. Agassi. And Charles Darwin. I guess my French is terrible. Uh, well, it is Swiss, but it's, it's, I think it's French Swiss, isn't it? Yeah, you can take your pick. He, he, uh, he ended up at Harvard. Uh, yes, and uh, we're going to discuss him in the next chapter, which is titled Darwin's Nemesis. When Charles Darwin had finished his famous book, he thought that he had explained every clue except one. Um, the twin pillars of his theory were universal common ancestry, and natural selection. And um, universal common ancestry, he doesn't actually have a drawing in his book. I think there's one very simple one. But uh, this is um, Ernst Haeckel, who was, uh, I think, a younger contemporary and um, uh, fairly enthusiastic, as you can see. He made some detailed drawings about uh, plants, protists, and animals, uh, all coming from an original tree of life, which presumably were the protists to begin with. Agassiz read the book with deep interest, but in the end, his verdict would disappoint its author. Agassiz concluded that the fossil record, particularly the record of the explosion of Cambrian animal life, posed an insuperable difficulty for Darwin's theory. And uh, there's uh, Agassiz on the left and uh, Charles Darwin. In an 1874 Atlantic Monthly essay entitled Evolution and the Permanence of Type, Agassiz explained his reasons for doubting the creative power of natural selection. Small-scale variations, he argued, had never produced a specific difference, that is, a difference in species. Meanwhile, large-scale variations, whether achieved gradually or suddenly, inevitably resulted in sterility or death. As he put it, it is a matter of fact that extreme variations finally degenerate or become sterile. Like monstrosities, they die out. Darwin himself insisted that the process of evolutionary change he envisioned must occur very gradually for the same reason. Thus, Darwin realized that building, for, for instance, a trilobite from single-celled organisms by natural selection operating on small step-by-step -step variations would require countless transitional forms and failed biological experiments over vast stretches of geologic time. As University of Washington paleontologist Peter Ward would later explain, Darwin had very specific expectations for what paleontologists would find below the lowest known strata of animal fossils, in, particularly, in particular, intervening strata showing fossils of increasing complexity until finally trilobites occurred, appeared. As Darwin noted, if my theory be true, it is indisputable that before the lowest Silurian, which was the name that was given to the Cambrian at that time, and we'll get a little more history of that in a bit. Stratum was deposited, long periods elapsed, as long as or probably far longer than the whole interval from the Silurian age to the present day, and that during these vast yet quite unknown periods of time, the world swarmed with living creatures. And by the way, I might add that his followers today still believe that. Uh, the split between the protostomes and the deuterostomes is usually put about 900 uh, million years, which is uh, tw close to fi twice 540. And long before you find any fossils. Yes, and the um, uh, fossils themselves supposedly go back something like 3.8 billion years. So 
uh, what Darwin said here is really uh, remarkably up to date. The mechanism of natural selection necessarily had to work gradually on small incremental variations. And indeed, the kind of variations that Darwin actually observed and de described in developing his analogy between natural and artificial selection were in every case minor. Only by selecting and accumulating minor variations over many generations were breeders able to produce the striking changes in the features of a breed. Changes that were, nevertheless, extraordinarily modest compared to the radical differences in form between, say, Precambrian and Cambrian forms of life. At the end of the day, as Agassiz hastened to note, the pigeons Darwin cited in support of the creative power of artificial and by analogy natural selection were still pigeons. More significant changes to the form and anatomical structure of organisms would, by the logic of Darwin's mechanism, require untold millions of years, precisely what seemed unavailable in the case of the Cambrian explosion. If Darwin is right, I guess he argued, then we should find not just one or a few missing links, but innumerable links shading almost imperceptibly from alleged ancestors to presumed descendants. Geologists, however, had found no such myriad of transitional forms leading to the Cambrian fauna. Instead, the stratigraphic column seemed to document the abrupt appearance of the earliest animals. Agassiz thought the evidence of abrupt appearance in the absence of ancestral forms in the Precambrian refuted Darwin's theory. Of these earlier forms, Agassiz asked, where are their fossilized remains? He insisted that Darwin's picture of the history of life contradicted what the animal forms buried in the rocky strata of our Earth tells us of their own introduction and succession upon the surface of the globe. Let us therefore hear them, for after all, their, tes their testimony is that of the eyewitness and the actor in the scene. And uh, then he noticed that there's some other people that also disagreed. Darwin, for his part, responded with more than civility. Far from dismissing Agassiz, he conceded that his objection carried considerable force. Nor was Agassiz alone in presenting these concerns. Other leading naturalists thought the fossil evidence presented a significant obstacle to Darwin's theory. <coughs> At the time, perhaps the best place to investigate the lowest known strata of fossils was Wales. And one of its leading experts was Roderick M. P. Murchison, who named the earliest geologic period the Silurian, after an ancient Welsh tribe. Five years before On the Origin of Species, he called attention to the sudden appearance of complex designs like the compound eyes of the first trilobites creatures already thriving at the apparent dawn of animal life. For him, this discovery ruled out the idea that these creatures had evolved gradually from some primitive and relatively simple form. The earliest signs of living things, announcing as they do a high complexity of organization, entirely exclude the hypothesis of a transmutation from lower to higher grades of being. The other pioneering explorer of Wales' rich fossil record, Adam Sedgwick, also thought that Darwin had leaped beyond the evidence, as he told him in a letter in the fall of 1859. You have deserted after a start, um, that's an artifact of copying, in uh, that tram road of all solid physical truth, the true method of induction. Sedgwick might have in mind the same evidence the two men had studied together some 28 years before when the Cambridge professor had bought, brought Darwin along as his field assistant to explore in the upper Swansea Valley in northwestern Wales the very strata that seemed to testify so powerfully to the sudden appearance of animal life. <coughs> it was these strata that Sedgwick named after a Latinized English term for the country of Wales, Cambria, a designation that eventually replaced Silurian as the name for the earliest strata of animal fossils. Actually, the Silurian is still there. It's just uh, the, the upper Silurian is now named the Silurian. And then in between, there's the Ordovician, and then there's the Cambrian, if I remember correctly. Right. Um, so when you hear Darwin talking about the Silurian, he's actually talking about the lower Silurian, or to be precise, the Cambrian. <coughs> 
Uh, the book then discusses other sudden appearances and disappearances. Uh, those of you who are interested can read it. Uh, and then he talks about a solution unseen, which is not to say a solution that nobody can see, but it, that, that uh, nobody can find a solution. Of course, Darwin was well aware of these problems. As he noted in The Origin, the abrupt manner in which whole groups of species suddenly appear in certain formations has been urged by several paleontologists. For instance, and I think that's an artifact of uh, copying as well. Uh, for instance, by Agassiz, Pictet, and Sedgwick. As a fatal objection to the belief in the transmutation of species, if numerous species belonging to the same genera or families had re really started into life all at once, the fact would be fatal to the theory of descent with slow modification through natural selection. That's in the origin of species. So if the Cambrian explosion is real, according to Darwin, his theory is toast. Darwin, however, proposed a possible solution. He suggested that the fossil record might be, may be significantly incomplete. Either the ancestral forms, the Cambrian animals, of the Cambrian animals, uh, were not fossilized or they hadn't been found yet. I look at the natural geological record as a history of the world imperfectly kept and written in a changing dialect, Darwin wrote. Of this history, we possess the last volume alone, relating to only to two or three countries. Of this volume, only here and there a short chapter has been preserved, and of each page, only here and there a few lines. On this view, the difficulties above discussed are greatly diminished or even disappear. In other words, the data don't fit, so what's really going on is there's more data, they just haven't found it yet. Or perhaps it was never actually fossilized in the first place. Darwin himself was less than satisfied with this explanation. Agassiz, for his part, would have none of it. Both with Darwin and his followers, a great part of the argument is purely negative, he wrote. They throw off the responsibility of proof. However broken the geologic record may be, there is a complete sequence in many parts of it from which the character of the succession may be ascertained. On what basis did he make this claim? Since the most exquisitely delicate structures as well as embryonic phases of growth of the most perishable nature had been preserved from very early deposits, we have no right to infer the disappearance of types because their absence disproves some favorite theory. Referring, of course, to Darwin. In other words, the evidence isn't there, and you're doing special pleading. Was Agassiz ignorant or fatally flawed, which are two ways of explaining why he got left in kind of a cultural backwater? Because after a while, the scientists all move along. Well, ignorant. Um, hardly fits. What a set of men you have at Harvard, Darwin, told the American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Both our universities put together cannot furnish the like. Why, there is Agassiz. He counts for three. Quite a compliment to somebody. I, it's really hard to maintain that he's ignorant. And there were arguments made, and uh, if you want to read them, they're listed pretty well in the book, that Agassiz was an idealist and just simply couldn't handle empiricism. But uh, as he notes there, um, as um, Edward Lurie concedes, Agassiz's stature among American scientists grew out of his unrivaled knowledge of geology, paleontology, ichthyology, comparative anatomy, and taxonomy. In other words, no. Um, it, he also appears to have gone to great lengths, literally and figuratively, to assess on the origin of species empirically. By going, that should be italicized, uh, by uh, going as far as to make a research voyage trace, retracing Darwin's trip to the Galapagos Islands. He actually got in a boat and sailed over there. As he explained to German zoologist uh, Karl Gegenbauer, uh, 
He wanted to study the Darwinian theory free from all external influences and former prejudices. Doesn't sound like somebody who couldn't handle a new idea. The idea that religious or philosophical prejudice compromised Agassiz's scientific judgment raises other questions. As historian Neil Gillespie explains, Agassiz was second to no man in his opposition to sectarian religious interference with science. Moreover, Agassiz showed himself perfectly willing to accept natural mechanisms where before supernatural intervention had been the preferred explanation. Since he regarded as material forces and the laws of nature that described them as the products of an underlying design plan, he saw any creative work they did as deriving ultimately from a creator. So the creator uses natural law, big deal. For instance, he assumed that this was the case with the development of embryos. He attributed their natural evolution from zygote to adult as a natural phenomenon and considered this no threat to his belief in a creator. He also readily accepted the notion of a naturally evolving solar system. He thought a skillful cosmic architect could work through secondary natural causes every bit as effectively as through direct acts of agency. The marginalia in his copy of On the Origin of Species suggests that he had the same attitude concerning biological evolution. This is his copy of The Origin, which he had read before he uh, felt that it was fatally flawed. Um, what is the great difference, he wrote, between supposing that God makes variable species or that he makes laws by which species vary? And God could do it either way, and it didn't bother him. A third problem with the official portrait of Darwin's chief rival concerns Lurie's suggestion that Agassiz was a master of particulars, but not of generalizing from those particulars. A really sharp guy, but he just can't put it all together. The historical record suggests otherwise. For example, Agassiz was the man who ably generalized from a wide variety of particular clues in his work on the Ice Age, winning over the geological establishment by demonstrating how a range of facts were best explained by the action of retreating glaciers. You have um, Agassiz to thank for that theory. Here a direct comparison between Darwin and Agassiz is possible. Each searched for an explanation of a curious geologic phenomenon in the Scottish Highlands, the parallel roads of Glen Roy. Glen Roy is the valley of the River Roy, and although it's a place of breathtaking beauty, what visitors found most intriguing about it over the years were its three parallel roads that wind along the canyon walls on either side of the river. <coughs> Scottish legend held that they were hunting paths <coughs> built for use by the early Scottish kings, or perhaps even for the mythical warrior Fingal. Scientists later argued that the roads were natural rather than artificial. And there's a uh, drawing, presumably from a photograph, of the roads. And you can see three parallel roads that kind of wind around. Um, Darwin and Agassiz were both convinced that natural processes were the cause. But they nevertheless arrived at different explanations. What was the end of the matter? In his autobiography, Darwin explained, having been deeply impressed with what I had seen of the elevation of the land in South America, I attributed the parallel lines to the action of the sea. But I had to give up this view when Agassiz propounded his glacier lake theory. Subsequent investigations in the late 19th and early 20th century confirmed that Agassiz's interpretation was the correct one. Agassiz then was far more than just a walking encyclopedia or an insatiable gatherer of fossils who couldn't see the proverbial forest for the trees. Those who insist otherwise can point to but one example to support their position, namely his rejection of Darwin's theory. But they cannot use that example to establish his general inability to interpret evidence and then turn around and use that supposed inability to explain his failure to accept Darwin's theory. This is to argue in a circle. There's a far more obvious solution to the historical puzzle 
posed by the great Agassiz's objection to Darwin's theory, the fossils of the Cambrian strata do, in fact, arise abruptly in the geologic record in clear defiance of what Darwin's theory would lead us to expect. In short, a genuine mystery is at hand. Two final considerations lend support to this view. First, as already noted, Darwin himself accepted the validity of Agassiz's objection. As he acknowledged elsewhere in the origin, to the question why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to those assumed earliest periods prior to the Cambrian system, I can give no satisfactory answer. The case at present must remain inexplicable and may, truly, may be truly urged as a valid argument against the views here entertained. You might be right. Second, Darwin's attempt to account for the absence of the expected fossil ancestors of the Cambrian forms failed to address the full strength and subtlety of Ag Agassiz's objection. As Agassiz explained, the problem with Darwin's theory was not just the general incompleteness of the fossil record or even a pervasive absence of ancestral, ancestral forms of life in the fossil record. Rather, the problem, according to Agass Agassiz, was the selective incompleteness of the fossil record. Why, he asked, does the fossil record always happen to be incomplete at the nodes connecting major branches of Darwinian, Darwin's tree of life, but rarely, in the parlance of modern paleontology, at the, quote, terminal branches, end quote, re representing the majority, major already known groups of organisms. These terminal branches were well represented, often stretching over many generations and millions of years, while the internal branches at the connecting nodes of Darwin's tree of life were nearly always, and selectively, absent. As Agassiz explained, Darwin's theory rests partly on the assumption that in the succession of ages, just those transition types have dropped out of the geologic record, which would have proved the Darwinian conclusions had these types been preserved. To Agassiz, it sounded like a just-so story, one that explains away the evidence of abs of absence of evidence rather than generally genuinely explaining. Now, again, I'm summarizing some. Uh, I guess he was left in a, in a historical scientific backwater. And meanwhile, more evidence was produced in the Cambrian, and that's when we move on to our next uh, comment. Now, I might ask just very quickly, where are we today? And um, I say it's still a problem today, and I call as my witness one Clinton Richard Dawkins. Um, <clears throat> for example, this is in The Blind Watchmaker. The Cambrian strata of rocks, vintage about 600 million years, are the oldest ones in which we find most of the major invertebrate groups. And we find many of them already in an advanced state of evolution, the very first time they appear. It is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted creationists. Now, there's a history behind this quote, and I'm going to give that to you now. Um, in River Out of Eden, uh, Dawkins says, the fossil record, like the spy camera and the murder story, is a bonus, something we had no right to expect as a matter of entitlement. And you can read the, uh, the before that for context. There's already more than enough evidence to convict the butler without the spy camera, and the jury were about to deliver a guilty verdict before the spy camera was discovered. Similarly, there is more than enough evidence from the fact of evolution, for the fact of evolution in the comparative study of modern species, chapter 10, and their geolog geographical distribution, chapter 9. We don't need fossils. For Dawkins, the fossils are really not even necessary for proof. The case for evolution is watertight, okay, without them. So it is paradoxical to use gaps in the fossil record as though they were evidence against evolution. We are, as I say, lucky to have fossils at all. What would be evidence against evolution, and very strong evidence at that, would be the discovery of even a single fossil in the wrong geological stratum. 
I've already made this point in Chapter 4. J.B.S. Haldane famously <coughs> retorted when asked to name an observation that would disprove the theory of evolution, fossil rabbits in the Precambrian. Um, is it fossil rabbits or a fossil rabbit? It's not clear. But since it was an orally uh, reported statement, uh, we'll probably never know. No such rabbits, no authentically anachronistic fossils of any kinds have ever been found. Um, you may recall our, our uh, discussion from last week. <coughs> All the fossils that we have, and they're very, very many indeed, occur without a single authenticated exception in the right temporal sequence. Yes, there are gaps where there are no fossils at all, but that is only to be expected. But not a single solitary fossil has ever been found before it could have evolved. Uh, okay, that is a very telling fact, and there is no reason why we should expect it on the creationist theory. As you briefly mentioned in chapter four, a good theory, a, a scientific theory, is one that is vulnerable to disproof, yet is not disproved. Evolution could so easily be disproved if just a single fossil turned up in the wrong date order. Evolution has passed this test with flying colors. <coughs> I, I say this partly because there are people who, uh, evolutionists don't make that argument, do they? Well, I guess they do. Um, <coughs> skeptics of evolution, uh, we have an overlap there, who, um, wish to prove their case should be diligently scrabbling around in the rocks, desperately trying to find anachronistic fossils. Maybe they'll find one. Want to bet? I wonder what would happen if you did find a whale in the, uh, er, in the Cambrian. It would be an interesting question. Um, the biggest gap, and the ones creationists like best of all, is the one that preceded the so-called so Cambrian explosion. A little more than half a billion years ago, in the Cambrian era, most of the great animal phyla, the main divisions within the animal world, suddenly appear in the fossil record. Now, I'm giving you the, well, his comments here. Suddenly, that is, in the sense that no fossils of these animal groups are known in the rocks older than the Cambrian. Not suddenly in the sense of instantaneously. The period we're talking about covers about 20 million years. Uh, uh, Steve Meyer will dispute that, he'll say it's more like 10 and maybe even 5 in some cases, but you know, <laughs> it's close. 20 million years feels like short when it is half a billion years ago. But of course it, re it represents exactly the same amount of time for evolution as, and again we're going to be down here, uh, 20 million years today. Anyway, it is quite sudden, and as I wrote in a previous book, the Cambrian, explosion, uh, Cambrian shows us how a substantial number of major animal phyla already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. It is though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted creationists. The last sentence showed that I was savvy enough to realize that creationists would like the Cambrian explosion. I was not, back in 1986, savvy enough to realize that they gleefully quote my lines back at me in their own favor over and over again, carefully omitting my careful words of explanation. On a whim, I just searched the World Wide Web for, it is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Um, that's highlighted because that uh, was a search that I did to try to find uh, uh, that particular quote and obtained no fewer than 12, 1,250 hits as a crude controlled test of the hypothesis that the majority of these hits represent creation as quote minings. I tried searching as a comparison for the clause that immediately follows the above quotation in the blind watchmaker. Evolutionists of all stripes believe, however, that this really does represent a very large gap in the fossil record. I obtained a grand total of 63 hits compared to the 1,250 hits for the previous sentence. The ratio of 1250 to 63 is 19.8. We might call this the ratio of the quote mining index. So he's upset because we quote him as an authority. Now, I'm going to, you can see that the next thing goes down to talk about flatworms and so forth, which um, is kind of sort of related, um, but is not directly related to this. So. Let's see the quote mining stuff. <clears throat> 
Um, well, let's keep going. Dawkins' comments were in a chapter ta talking about punctuated equilibrium and where he is arguing that part of it's not new and the other part of it is wrong. The American paleontologist Niels Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould, when they first proposed their theory of punctuated e equilibria in 1972, made what has since been represented as a very different suggestion. They suggest that actually the fossil record may not be as imperfect as we thought. Maybe the gaps are a true reflection of what really happened, mm -hmm. rather than being the annoying but inevitable consequences of an imperfect fossil record. Maybe they suggest evolution really did in some sense go in sudden bursts, punctuating long periods of stasis where no evolutionary change took place in a given lineage. So this is the context of where he's coming from. Mm -hmm. Now he's going to try to destroy it. Before we come to the sort of sudden bursts that they had in mind, there are some conceivable meanings of sudden bursts that they most definitely did not have in mind. These must be cleared out of the way because they have been the subject of serious misunderstandings. Eldridge and Gould certainly would agree that some very important gaps really are due to imperfections in the fossil record. Because this is his point one, and this is where he introduces very big gaps too. For example, the Cambrian strata of rocks, vintage about 600 million years of the oldest ones in which we find most of the major invertebrate groups. And we find many of them already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. It, it, and here's the famous quote. It is though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted creationists. Now, that's the paragraph. The next paragraph. <coughs> and this is the part he wants you to see. So if they ever do a search for me, I guess I'll be one of those that report both. Um, evolutionists of all stripes believe, however, that this really does not represent a large gap in the fossil record, a gap that is simply due to the fact that for some reason very few fossils have lasted from periods before about 600 million years ago. Uh, pardon me, this really does represent that gap. One good reason might be, now notice, what he's just got through saying is it looks like they were just planted there, and he's saying no the fossil record is incomplete here. Evolutionists simply don't believe that. Um, one good reason might be that many, many of these animals had only soft parts to their bodies, no shells or bones to fossilize. If you're a creationist, you may think that this is special pleading. My point here is that while we're talking about gaps of this magnitude, there's no difference whatever in the interpretations of punctuationists and gradualists. Both schools of thought despise so-called scientific creationists equally, and both agree that the major gaps are real and that they are true imperfections in the fossil record. Both schools of thought agree that the only alternative explanation of the sudden appearance of many, so many complex animal types in the Cambrian era is divine creation, and both would reject this alternative. So, if you're quoting that to say that it looks like they're just planted there. I think you can say safely that you have correctly Dar uh, Dawkins thought on it. And the fact that you don't go on to say that, well, evolutionists, of course, believe that the fossil record is incomplete. Evolutionists of every stripe, Dawkins stripe, Gould stripe, and in between and outside. <coughs> Well, of course they don't. Otherwise, you couldn't be an evolutionist. But I fail to see how the quoting of the short paragraph, or the, 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 that paragraph, uh, makes, it a, uh, makes it quote mining, because it seems like you're quoting exactly what he believes. But maybe you guys have different views on that. And uh, I will turn the microphone over to you guys. I'll make a comment. Okay. Um, first, <clears throat> my state, uh, I think Meyer, he overlooked a point that he could have said. There's a vast difference 
between uh, Gould and Eldridge's punctuated equilibrium and the gaps in the fossil record. And by this, I mean it's, we do find intermediates throughout the fossil record and so on, and you, to a certain extent, uh, and Gould and Eldridge wanted little changes, like Darwin wanted little changes, but we're talking about major differences between fossils. Uh, the challenge is that while you can find intermediates between certain fossil kinds, and you can interpret that as different created types, and so on, depending on how close they're related and whatnot, or, or degeneration, or uh, act actual evolution of a very simple type, such as resistance to antibiotics and so on. Uh, but where you'd expect the greatest number of fossils is between the phyla, and that's precisely where they don't find them. And this is where the challenge is really severe. Yeah, the, the further apart the organisms are in terms of body plan and so forth, the more intermediates you'd expect, which means the more intermediate fossils you'd expect, and yet it's easier to find, let's say, things that could be considered interspecific. Um, and it's real easy to find intersubspecific fossils. Whereas the further apart the body plans are, the harder it is to find intermediates. The higher you go to the categories in the uh, taxon taxonomic organization and so on, the fewer fossils you find. And when you come to between phyla, there are essentially none. And that's where you'd expect the greatest number. Well, I, I think there's something that we need to be very careful about how we phrase that. And the reason why is because phyla, of course, are our own classifications of what we think. Um, and that's why I use the phrase differences in body plan. Because, for example, to get from a starfish, which is a deuterostome, to a fish, which is also a deuterostome, you have to go from five-fold symmetry to bilateral symmetry. That is, a fish has the mirror images, if you cut it right down the, the middle, the one half looks like the mirror image of the other. Whereas, if you have a starfish, you have radial five-fold symmetry. This is a whole different way of organizing. Now, I don't know whether the five-fold symmetry was put on top of the uh, bilateral symmetry or vice versa, or whether they were both creations by an intelligent designer, I rather suspect the latter. Uh, but, uh, but if you're going to try to do without a designer, it seems like somewhere there should be some kind of intermediate, and yet it's difficult to even visualize what it would look like, let alone how to produce it certainly how to keep it alive while it's switching in between those two. Uh, that's just one example of two different uh, deuterostomes. There's the uh, protostomes as well, um, you know, where, where you have to go, I guess, uh, uh, aren't brachiopods protostomes? Yes, well, most, most invertebrates are protostomes. So yeah. you should have an intermediate between a brachiopod and a, um, and uh, let's say an arthropod, uh, trilobite. There's no intermediates. Right. And I think if Dawkins had one or two examples that were really good, he would have used them. And interestingly, when you look at the eye of a protostome like a squid and the eye of a vertebrate, uh, they're designed exactly almost the same and they're, they're supposed to have separated out long before they ever had eyes in the, in the uh, evolutionary process. Yes. Uh, I think that it's interesting. I believed uh, 
from your remarks at first that this presentation would be primarily about the question of whether or not non-living uh, material or matter could produce uh, living organisms that contain the kind of information that is involved in the DNA. But somehow we've put the primary emphasis now on the question of after life is already here, uh, can simple forms well, that was uh, uh, undergo micro mutations acted upon by mm -hmm. natural selection yeah. to that produce the gaps yeah. that we see that was, between uh, species. Yeah, that was uh, Steve Meyer's comment. See, he wrote the book Signature in the Cell, and and he wrote it about the origin of life itself. Mm -hmm. But well, what I happened was that people argued against it, never brought up anything about the origin of life. They started to say, mm -hmm. "Well, do, you can get information if you have already living stuff." And he says. I have three comments I'd like to make about that, very briefly. Uh, first, the transition from non-living to living does involve a tremendous leap in information. However, if you consider cosmology seriously as an ongoing process, uh, you find nested, implicative hierarchies involving repetitive cycles that are mathematically predictable that suggest intelligence just as much in the non-living world as you do in the living world. Uh, this is not the leap that you might at first think in terms of information. As uh, Sir James Jean says in The Mysterious Universe, the more we learn about the cosmos, the world of matter, the more it begins to look like a great thought rather than a great machine in terms of or as intelligent Hoyle would put design. It, it, the universe is a Now, when, job. We come, when we come to living creatures, uh, the question is, is there, there are gaps in the fossil record to indicate a transition from one species to another. Uh, however, the Sewell Wright effect, which says the conditions making for fossilization are extremely complex in terms of climatology, chemistry of soil, all kinds of other things, mm -hmm. that populations that are very small seldom leave fossils. So if the transition from one species to another, or as Gould suggests, by punctuated evolution rather than gradualism, we would assume that when a new species appears, there are very few of them. And it would be remarkable if they did leave any fossils, you would expect gaps. The third point is that, as you pointed out at the beginning of the presentation, you have two scenarios here. Intelligent design can work either de novo from nothing, uh, going from zero to with a uh, uh, life that has nested phylogenetic hierarchies and so on by an outright act of creation in six literal days. Or you can take the days as being figurative and you can talk about intelligent design through creation. So I think we come back to suggestions made two or three weeks ago by a gentleman sitting behind me who's not here today that we not only need to look at all of the ifs, and ands, and buts about Darwinian and population genetics and some of the newer wrinkles that E.O. Wilson has said uh, go, come into play like uh, individual survival versus uh, group survival, <coughs> the contrary working of those to produce complication, <laughs> and the recent suggestions that have been made that dynamic equilibria like life don't follow the second law of thermodynamics. That only applies to closed systems. And that living creatures, you expect them to become more complicated and more diverse. So I think we need to look with equal thoroughness at some of the different mm -hmm. scenarios for intelligent design and how it might work. And we can go back to the Bible for that. The 19th Psalm says, that uh, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork, which seems to suggest that if you use what we call reverse engineering, uh, 
by inspecting all the sciences that we've been talking about, uh, astronomy, astrophysics, physics, chemistry on the one hand, and zoology, botany, and microbiology, and so on. Uh, by reverse engineering those, we ought to get some idea of what we're talking about when we talk about intelligent design and an intelligent designer. Those aren't self-evident mm -hmm. concepts, and they permit as wide a range of scenarios or paradigms as evolution or uh, the things we've been talking about do. Um, the creation of the world is depicted on the fossils, and nature speaks of those volumes. So as a tree dies away, it has evidence. As the fossils die away, there is evidence also. The gaps are the distinctions between evidence, evidence to evidence, and the abstraction of the mind is the same thing as, as evidence. So with that abstraction, the fossilization must be canceled. And with that evidence, the evidence is true. Um, we have a comment back here, and I, while the microphone's getting there, I'll just make the comment that um, as, as we're going through the book, I want you to pay attention to several very important things. No, number one, how long of a period are we talking about? Um, inside estimate, outside estimate, most probable estimate. Number two, are there really intermediate forms? You'll see some claims for that. Number three, is the fossil record really incomplete? Or does it just simply not show what one theory requires and so that theory is calling it incomplete? That is to say, are there fossilized other things below this that suggest that we are fossilizing organisms during this time period, whatever it was, and that suggests that if it's not there, mm -hmm. maybe it's not there because it really wasn't there to begin with. And, uh, and then number four, does information theory back this kind of claim up? That is, does information theory suggest that we really should not expect those fossils in this area? Uh, and that what really is happening is uh, the neo-Darwinian mechanism is inadequate. Uh, hmm. and go ahead, Leonard. There are a lot of things we could say, but I'll just make a couple of comments. Um, a few years ago at the Geological Society of America annual meeting, there was a big discussion. They brought in some molecular biologists to talk about what is needed to evolve all these phyla. Um, and there were also the paleontologists. The paleontologists know what the fossils, what fossils that are there. And thus they try to figure out how you could evolve things that fast, because there's no fossils below it. The biologists, on the other hand, are insisting because of, um, you know, the things that are not from fossils, but just from knowing how genetics works that you have to have below the Cambrian another half a billion years of evolution to produce these phyla. In other words, they're agreeing with, Dar uh, with uh, Darwin in that one quote that we mentioned. Well, they're, they're It's still up to date. They're, yeah, this is all still up to date. They, they know that to, to far as we know of what about genetics, you'd have to have this half a billion years of evolution. The paleontologists know there's no fossils. And there was an interesting discussion between the group and, and uh, no resolution could be found. Um, so this very current um, conflict. An another comment, there's a paper that came out recently on a, somebody proposing a new theory for how life began. And a, as a, to begin his paper, he describes how all of the, the ideas of the evolution of life so far don't work. Well, that's interesting information. But then he goes on to propose his own theory. There's some kind of a big atomic explosion, and this brings a lot of things together and produces life. Where is his data? Pardon? Where, where is his data? Where, where is he published in? 
Uh, I have it in my lab. I couldn't tell you around. Uh, maybe if you can bring that uh, another week, it would be an interesting reference to have. I can supply that information. Uh, it appeared, I believe, in the uh, last issue of Discovery, and the uh, theory is advanced by Guth and Valensky. Uh, Guth at Stanford and Valensky at Tufts University. They're trying to argue that something can come from nothing. Uh, and uh, that the Big Bang uh, came from nothing and that it produced all the elements that eventually evolved into life and that you don't need intelligent design or anything like that to account for it. You know, that sounds to me an awful lot like the, a theory that Dawkins has derided many times, what he calls the poof theory. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would... Uh, I'd make a comment about the fossil record, you know. Uh, when you, are there really gaps there or we just haven't found them is an issue. Uh, but, you know, we have found millions and millions of fossils. And these practically always fall into major categories. How much of a sample do you need to make your case? Uh, you can always say, hey, yeah, well, it, and it's true. This is, the probability is there. But, the possibility, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, the possibility, I should say. Uh, or the low probability is there. Uh, but after so many years of looking up and down that fossil record and you find so many intermediates, you know there's a problem. It, uh, and uh, you find all kinds of, and they all generally always fall down in, in, in all these established groups that we have already. Uh, it, the vast number of intermediates we'd expect, and uh, you went over this, I think, and or, uh, Meyer went over it and so on. That, uh, of all these organisms trying to evolve, uh, most of them failing, of course, because mutations are random and they're not, they're not designed to produce progress and so on. Uh, you should, that fossil record should be loaded with intermediates trying to evolve from one type to the other, they aren't there. I, I think the case is fairly clear that uh, uh, there is a problem here for evolution. Well, like I say, Dawkins has not uh, repented. He keeps repeating that saying. It's as if they were planted there. And he's trying to argue from that that the fossil record must be incomplete. Um, but of course, what he's arguing and the facts he's arguing from are two different things. And the facts he's arguing from is something that I don't think anybody really contests seriously unless they're in an argumentative mode. Comment back here, and I think maybe we'll, we'll Le call it quits after Leonard that. Leonard has a comment also. Uh, oh, Leonard? Go ahead. And well, then over here. The fossil record does tell us that, they, that life in the past is more diverse in some ways than the, what we have now. So we do find some odd things. But like, for instance, um, it's interesting how the sequence of events of discoveries happens. Tiktaalik was a, a sort of a thought to be a, a key ancestor between uh, fish and, and amphibians. Um, and then a very clear set of, of amphibian tracks, fossil tracks, was found at least 10 million years older. So it makes Tiktaalik irrelevant. Uh, and also in the whale, the whale fossil sequence was thought to be one of their, one of their big successes um, until one of the key early fossils thought to be sort of amphibious uh, was better skeleton was found and it's completely terrestrial, has nothing to do with, with any becoming aquatic. And also <coughs> a fully aquatic whale was found that is older, is clear at the beginning of their supposed sequence. So Fully aquatic whales have been here all that time. And, uh, so these things keep coming up, so you've got to keep, keep in tune for what's coming up next. There's always one question that comes into my mind. What if 
man had never accepted naturalism as the ultimate thing as far as origins go. And that, that they always held on to God. What would they have done with that, this data? Well, they, the, I don't um, know that we can, you know, that's a hypothetical that doesn't uh, actually well, exist. Well, no, it's not. But we, it's can not make, we can make an intelligent guess by saying that most creationists who do try to ignore or at least not use evolutionary theory as a major part of their reconstruction will say that the Cambrian probably represents the seafloor bottom at the time of the flood. And if you look at the seafloor bottom today, it has many weird organisms of many different kinds. And if they were to suddenly be buried together, we would uh, look at them as very strange from what we have today, but also very varied in very, you know, there are shrimps, there are uh, cephalopods, there are uh, vertebrates of various kinds down there um, already, uh, bivalves, whatever. Um, and so uh, if we were to bury, we wouldn't have strange things like hallucinogenia. We wouldn't uh, necessarily have all of the old Cambrian stuff, but we'd have a fairly wide variety. And so that's what you'd expect from the very earliest sea bottoms as they're being covered up. But, but it, you know, what you've just described there is something that could have been described many years ago. True. Many, many years ago. True. So how would all this new data change that idea? Uh, there wouldn't be any change. Everything would fit into that explanation you just gave. So I'm just wondering just how would it have formed, how would it would have been increased or bettered if all this time was actually given to the belief of God? Um, it's a good question. And uh, I, I suppose it's one we can explore together sometime. Um, anyway, next week, uh, come we'll, uh, d we'll discuss uh, the Burgess Shale and uh, uh, the f new finds in China. Um, and we'll see, you know, whether there really is an explosion, how long it took, and how, uh, in standard geologic terms, and how long, uh, and, and how explosive it really was. <laughs>